Here we go. We'll try it. Okay. Okay. Sorry, sorry, technical. No, don't worry about it. But yeah, welcome to the dark side, the private sector. A lovely place to be, especially in my day to day. So we hear a lot about being greener, being more aware, being more conscious about the communities that the products and the outputs of private sector entities and different industrial branches target. It's overwhelmingly present on LinkedIn. It's entering even Instagram. You can't live without this narrative of companies are doing their best to be green, to be lean and to perform better. But the truth of the matter is each industrial branch is doing something, but we can't ignore that they're all correlated. And for that, Maya, please hit the button uh, to share the presentation as we will be taking you down through the trickle of exhaust, pollution, acid rain, and whatnot through a various amount of industrial branches. <laughs> I will be your Darth Vader guide today. Um, but welcome to industrial production, friend or foe of the future. Maya, if you can go please to the next slide. Thank you. So individual accountability is something we hear on a day-to-day -day basis as well. The pressure is put on the end consumer to choose something that is better, that is leaner, that is not that polluting or can be dissolved in water or whatnot. The point of the matter is you can only be as sustainable as the choices you can make and the choices are limited by the outputs of industrial branches. And to get to these industrial outputs, there is a lot of natural resources, energy being used, but also exhaust and pollution that come with it before the end product reaches our doorstep. And that is precisely why we should care. The industrial branches are all correlated and we'll just see like now how it trickles from fossil fuels to the automotive sector and we'll later on hear about the food industry, its waste and its potential from Maya. Please Maya hit the next slide. <laughs> So we, we hear about a lot about, you know, started thinking green and whatnot. Did you know that industrial production sites actually make up half of the global carbon footprint? So whatever we do as individuals, it can never reach the, the heights and mites of these industrial pollutants. The optimal usage of resources is lacking, particularly when it comes to really toxic industries such as pharmaceuticals, chemicals, tires, so anything rubber and plastic. Those companies, from my day-to-day -day experience of working with them and trying to make them leaner, is that they do not know how their production line looks like. They have a lot of blind spots and therefore they use up and throw out a lot of natural resources such as caoutchoucs and whatnot before they even get to any point of being a tire or like a tupperware or anything else you can imagine in your day to day. So there's a lot of waste being generated there before we even reach half of the production phase. And not just that, the production is becoming faster. We're digitalizing, we're optimizing, we're doing whatnot. So whatever they're producing, they're innovating faster. And if it's innovating faster, like with the iPhone, you tend to switch it out after a few years, right? But how can you make sure that this doesn't just end up in oblivion, AKA become a micro particle in your lungs? And that's why we should start thinking green and not just on an individual level, but also make the industry more accountable on all industrial branch levels. And enjoy the meme of, I'll hold up a big kite and you'll blow air at me until I lift off. What do you think of that idea? I'm not a huge fan. <laughs> it is not a huge fan. <laughs> Maya, if you would hit the next slide. So, you know, <coughs> we tend to add a lot of things <coughs> made with natural resources and whatnot, but adding a natural in front of resource doesn't make the outcome less toxic. And that's particularly the case when it comes to mining. Mining is still predominantly driven by fossil fuels. Before we even excavate them, we use them for the excavation process itself. The green initiatives are only driven because they enlarge the profit margin. It cuts costs, it enlarges the productivity rates. Therefore, they remain superficial and only selective. So for example, they would switch to a motor that consumes less fuel, but in the end, the pollution outcome and index remain the same for us end users that live maybe nearby a mining site. When it comes to mining, it's, it's, it's just so funny to see because you would think of it as something separate, old and whatnot. 
but we, we will see in a few slides just how omnipresent it is even at the most advanced level, your car. Before we get started on the next branch, just keep in mind that mining still causes acid rain that's, that can be up to 300 times more acidic than actually like acid rain, like the, the acids that come from drainages enter the waterways. They completely destroy the ecosystems, the wildlife and whatnot. Reclamation sites do exist. However, the nature never fully recovers from mining and the other activities that come with it. Something you should be keeping in mind for the rest of this presentation is that mining lithium for batteries is something very toxic, but nobody talks about it in another industrial branch while they promote something. Maya, please hit the next button. <laughs> Mining, as I said, requires a lot of energy. And when we say energy, it's omnipresent. You need it, you switch on your TV, you charge your phone, or even your doorbell rings powered by some kind of energy. Everyone likes to say that the energy rate has been green or put on a building in the EU that the power, it's powered by green energy. But statistically speaking, that is not possible. That just indicates that a smaller percentage of this, the electricity generator or the heat that comes to the building is actually green. When we look at the numbers, 22% of the whole energy consumption in the EU is actually completely green. So either solar, wind or water driven. So let me ask you, how does that come about in Austria, for example, which claims that in Vienna, there's over 300 buildings having green, completely green energy. It's not feasible, statistically a mistake. And that's how you know that green does not automatically mean completely green. There is a lot of fossil fuels happening and we see that the energy delivery systems and the supply chains collapse easily, especially in relation to COVID-19 and the Ukraine crisis. Germany saw a 5% decrease in renewable energy supplies because they started panicking and shifted to banning the coal initiative, which was limiting the use of coal, and also are looking at reactivating certain nuclear plants within their countries. With Austria, 30% of the energy consumed in the country is renewable, primarily driven through waterways, which means that all of the windmills that are, Austria is kind of also becoming famous for don't actually add that much up because they're not connected yet to the system properly. <laughs> they're also currently in talks about lifting the bans on Russia for very selfish purposes, and that is for pure heat survival in the winter. So winter is coming and more than a Game of Thrones way when it comes to Austria and their democracy. Uh, Maya, please take us away to the third and most powerful impact. So we've seen that mining is dependent on energy and it uses up a lot of energy and it also helps us again focus on the fossil fuels instead of renewables. But there is a third industry that is directly impacted and also plays a part in this whole ploy of being green and lean and whatnot. It's the automotive industry. So the previous two influenced it on the level of sustainability, particularly car batteries, but also charging stations. As we saw in the previous slide, 22% of electricity in the EU is only green, which means whatever you're charging your car with is like a vegan secretly eating meat, meat on, the, on the meme in the <laughs> down left corner. But not just that, the question of car batteries raises itself. And it's not just car batteries. Think about electric bikes. Think about the little scooters, the e-sharing business itself. You will see often in the EU little sort of like veto vans pulling up with battery replacements. But what happens to the old batteries? And that for the meme in the upper left corner, slaps roof of the Pacific Ocean, this boy will hold so many car batteries. But not just that, bike batteries, scooter batteries and whatnot. How do we recycle them? How do we minimize the impact of the assets that leach out of those batteries we're not using anymore? That is a question to keep in mind. And the third picture that you see is what happens once you start mining for lithium, something that is dear and near to my heart because Serbia is currently being pestered by Zijin, which is a large Chinese company who's trying to bore for, for lithium in the middle of a nice little forest that everyone loves. And it's only like, it's only just like under natural protection from the EU, from UNESCO, as well as from the Serbian state itself. But oh, well, you know, we can apparently live without it. <laughs> I hope this explains a bit more about that 
thinking about industrial branches doesn't just mean like, oh my God, I bought this organic piece of food or it's packaged in some recycled cartonage. Or thinking about, you should, we should start thinking about the supply chains behind it from energy that is being used, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in mining, whether it's for the automotive industry. Also, when it comes to food, we should also be thinking about the paper industry because not all papers, although it says they're recyclable, they might have some, you know, plastic foils on them that make them not so recyclable in the end. So it's all about thinking through the whole supply chain. And the ploy is bigger than it seems up front. And you might be thinking it's sustainable, but you can end up being a vegan that secretly eats meat. <laughs> Maya, hit us the next slide. <laughs> And let's wrap up this bad boy. So to give you more insights and intel about how this trickle down across industrial branches works, I've provided here a list of short and sweet little newspaper articles, but also research on the topics of the supply chains and how each industrial branch influences the next ones. But before we wrap up, I have a few fun facts about my employer themselves. I am very critical, although I am kind of the Darth Vader in training in my company, um, of what they do and how we approach this. Siemens is a multinational and omnipresent when it comes to the automotive industry, the chemicals, the pharmaceuticals, even agriculture, and particularly mining. It's operating in the EU, in Asia, it's operating in the US, but the company, you know, does not use any Siemens electrical grids for powering their eco-efficient building, although we are selling them as the market leaders. Um, we are also selling a lot of digitalization products, but I will tell you one thing, we have not digitalized anything in the finance department besides an Excel sheet. <laughs> so, <laughs> Be very about how green, lean, efficient, and digital companies actually are, because the mo for the most part, are, those are still buzzwords, and we should be leeching onto them in hopes of a better future, but we're still not there yet. <laughs> and with that, I leave it to my co-host, my, my power tandem duo master, Maya. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that, Alex. Super informative. Love seeing you present again. It's been a while. Before I hop into my section, which is a little more rooted in just my own personal experiences with navigating um, sustainability with the private sector and some more discussion, because I'm really interested to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Um, before we hop into that, which is rooted again in food, and I, I'm also talking about um, regional development a bit. Just want to take a few minutes just for discussion if anyone has any gut reactions to what Alexandra was mentioning or just um, wanted to ask Alex any questions before we head over into my section. Um, I, I, you know, uh, that was done with a lot of humor, uh, Alexandra. It was really lovely before we go into your discussion, Maya. But and I keep thinking. At the root of everything, there are there is an issue of personal choices. If we simply don't drive a car, if we simply don't do an awful lot of the things that you mentioned, and we can, if we grow some of our own food near our home, if we if we really think about our own personal lifestyles, we can still make a great difference. And sometimes I think that the kind of talk that you gave, which is cynical and true and perhaps needed, but I would be very careful not to give it in certain places because it can like pour cold water on everyone's enthusiasm for doing anything. And that's that is a true. real, that's a that real true. danger. Yeah, you know, no, because I completely agree. But the thing is, uh, it's not about, tr uh, most people think about triggering choices within this consumerism bubble. So what am I purchasing? What am I doing? Instead of doing exactly what you said, it's like, am I growing like my own crops? Am I doing something personally? Am I, how am I driven and how can I do something for myself by myself? Which is something I love to trigger. The cynical thing, oh, well, you know, on a daily basis, I have to be the best friend of like most corporations. So do bear with me. <laughs> 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 so what you're really saying is that green consumerism is a myth. I would I would like to say if you think about your choices, maybe you should think about what is the alternative to the commercial. 
Okay. So, so Maya, you lead us on from there. <laughs> yeah, and, and just kind of wanted to bring a call back to Jason's conversation um, from last week, where Jason, you showed us a lot of different organizations, some of them of which are, you know, for profits. I know that some of them were selling different products and trying to make a profit in that way. And I feel like in those instances of like your mom and pop type of company who's like trying, who's truly trying to, you know, um, make a difference is oftentimes really different from these big corporations that Alexandra is talking about. So it's not as if the whole private sector, like I, I work for the private sector in, in a different capacity. Um, it's not as if every company, you know, is evil, but sometimes we have to be wary of these big corporations that also lobby our public sector for their own interests. You know, I just, I think Alex's main point is just to be kind of wary of those, um, of those big corporations. And what I'm going to talk about is really about what is the private sector's role in sustainability and how is it connected in different ways to um, the, the public sector and also the nonprofit sector. So just give me one moment while I bring up my own presentation. Okay. All right, so everyone should be able to see my screen now, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. So here I wanna talk about the, um, the food industry. So what is the role of private industries and in specifically in combating the issue of food waste? We know that in the food sector, there are many challenges, right? Um, access to nutritious and affordable uh, fruits and vegetables, as Yimi was uh, mentioning in her last presentation, um, the issue of sustainable farming practices so that we don't have toxic runoff into nearby water sources. But one issue that's really near and dear to my own personal life is the issue of food waste. So just rooting us a little bit in the facts, this is something that a lot of us probably know already, but about one third of all food is wasted before it's consumed. Um, and unused food is really, really toxic when it ends up in our landfills, which is where it usually goes. Um, it emits methane, which is over 80 times more powerful than CO2 and contributing to temperature increases. So really the issue of food waste, um, is something that I think about on an almost daily basis. So we know that there are zero waste principles in, um, in certain restaurants. We know that um, there's something really interesting called root to stem cooking or nose to tail approach, which is really trying to use every single inch of the food available to us so that it doesn't end up in the landfill. But we know in our own private lives, and I'll speak for myself here, I put food into the trash can and I feel like a horrible person each time I do that. So um, let's just take, uh, it's uh, around 10.30 a.m. in Florida right now and I had breakfast and I had some rice cakes, put some peanut butter and I wanted to slice some bananas on it and I did. And what do I do with my banana peel, which I know could be composted in, in, some, in some other iteration, I put it in the trash can. And this is something that I think about really often. I'm also vegan, so I'm, I'm constantly eating a lot of vegetables and fruits and, you know, there's apple cores and carrot tops and onion peels. And this is something that I've been thinking about for a really long time. So about a year ago, I said, you know what, Maya, like, let's, let's try something. So let's start composting on our own. Let's start taking our food scraps and, um, and trying to make something a little bit better for yourself. So basically what I would do here, this is a totally DIY compostable little bin that I had in my home. So I just took a plastic bin that I already had lying around. I lined it with some brown paper bags and put in a compostable bag into it. And essentially what I would do is every three to five days, I would, you know, this would get totally filled up with just my, my everyday consumption. I would then, when the bag was completely full, put it in the freezer. And then about every two weeks or so, I would go to the one place in a 50 mile radius within my home that accepts 
food scraps. Uh, this is called the Miami Beach Botanical Gardens. It's an amazing place, um, very close to where Eileen used to live when she was growing up um, in the heart of South Beach now. The only problem is it's a 45 minute drive, right? So now I'm driving out of my way. Um, in my, just, this is a personal issue. I share a car with my sister. And so bottom line is it, this worked well for about a month or two. And then it became really hard to, to structure my entire weekend around bringing in my frozen food scraps. <laughs> and uh, what would end up happening is I would have bags and bags of this in the freezer. And let's just say that my mom wasn't all too thrilled with all of these food scraps in her freezer. And now she has uh, no room in here. Um, so I know it would be ideal if I could just compost in my own backyard, but really my question for, for this group is, is there, is there a better way to be able to um, reduce the amount of food waste in, let's say, just an easier way too? So I wanted to bring in a case study of something that I found in, um, in South Korea. So I'm just going to read this out. So in 1995, South Korea replaced its flat tax for waste disposal with a new system. Recycling materials were picked up free of charge. Um, but for all other trash, the city imposed a fee, which was calculated by measuring the size and number of bags. By 2006, it was illegal to send food waste to landfills and dumps. Citizens were required to separate it out. The new waste policies were supposed to support were supported with grants to the then nascent recycling industry. These measures have led to a decrease in food waste per person of about three quarters of a pound a day, the weight of a Big Mac and fries or a couple of grapefruits. The country estimates the economic benefit of these policies to be over the years in the billions of dollars. The 13,000 tons of food waste produced daily in South Korea now becomes one of three things, compost, which is 30%, animal feed 60% or biofuel 10%. Um, so just a little bit more context um, on this specific case study in South Korea is that today South Korea recycles 95% of its food waste and 25 years ago almost nothing was recycled. So now you might be asking, okay, Maya, like what is the actual relation to the private industry? And here I really want to talk about the intersection of both the the public sector, the South Korean government, which really implemented this because they're running the municipalities, the people power of nonprofits, um, community councils who were really pushing for this, but also the private sector. This um, the article talked about how the private sector was really integral in, in producing the kinds of technologies needed to implement this in um, weighing the amount of compost that each, each family was producing by creating the, the different kinds of technological levers that were needed to actually um, turn it into animal feed and biofuel. So I thought this was a really interesting um, case study of just how the issues that we're trying to face in our everyday life and trying to be that best consumer and trying to be as green as possible can really be augmented with the help of the private sector. So that's a little bit about um, food. And before I move on to development, just, just wanted to hear if anyone had any thoughts about that, um, if, if anyone wanted to share like their own potential struggles with with food waste and maybe how they navigate it. I know we're, we're all living in different parts of the world. So would be really interested to hear everyone's perspective. Um, I, I, I have a question. Yes, uh, I question. My question is simple. Why can't you compost in your backyard? Yeah, I'm going to be completely honest. I can, and I just, I don't have that energy to be able to do that. Not that I don't have the energy, but it's really about, um, I, I would like an easier solution. I can very well put all of my food scraps in one place. I would love to donate it and for someone else to honestly do, do the compost. It's, it's really about, I guess this does come down to a consumer choice of mine. Um, but I would honestly just love an easier solution. And sometimes I do feel like that is where both the public and the private sector can help us here. Huh. Mm. <clears throat> so um, my, <laughs> my struggle with food waste and since I've been with the Jerusalem Green Fund is really um, become much 
much more satisfying to me is I've wanted to compost in our garden for years. And being um, tied to the king of any kind of bacteria in the world, the microbiologist, Jerome, because of the animals that roam around the neighborhood, so on and so forth, flatly thumbs down it. He refused. He didn't want it. He didn't want the, the mess, the things, the cats coming around, so on and so forth. So what I've done, and and I for about a week or two, I was bringing it to Naomi's <laughs> at the staff <laughs> meeting because she has a compost. But Daron and I consume and, and turn out so much food waste that Naomi said, you know, this is overwhelming for the amount that I give to my compost every day. And um, so what I started <laughs> is the same as you, Maya, but Jerusalem being much smaller than between your house and Miami Beach. I, when I go to the kids in Beta Kerem, they have a lovely big composting in their community garden. So it gives me also an excuse to go through my, to see my mother-in-law, or I'm always, you know, Duran says I never go out of the house without doing at least three, three things on the way. So this is a very good excuse, but what I do weigh is the carbon footprint. Because if I'm going to go specially, which especially, which is what happened to you on your way to Miami Beach, and I know I-95 and what that can mean as far as time between you and there. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, I am always weighing the, the advantages and the disadvantages and trying to think in this carbon footprint, which is Naomi thinking all these years in the carbon footprint. And that's why she doesn't have, she goes only on public transportation. And so I think, I think what we need to do personally, and we talked, we alluded and even touched on this last time, is prioritize what are those, those issues that are the most important to us. For me, throwing out food is also, it's, it, it's ridiculous. I just, it, it really nauseates me to think about that. And I would be very much more involved in other food waste projects in and around Israel and Jerusalem, but I, I landed in the Jerusalem Green Fund. Um, what I want to tell you, I mean, that's my own personal struggle. So, and even my very sterile lab, lab oriented husband, even now is putting all the cooking that he's doing in these little nice cans. And I found that if you squirt tea tree oil in them, then it really eliminates a lot of the odor. So he even lets me leave them on the kitchen counter and I've got my tea tree oil and now I squirt it towards the trash cans. I'm like into really big tea tree. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say was banana peels. So I've mentioned her before, the lady that raised my kids, the earth mom that raised my kids while I was out running around having a career in nonprofit organization and development. Um, was over two Wednesdays ago. And what one of our friends has told her that banana peels are extremely high. Maybe Yimi, you might know this, extremely high in magnesium, potassium, and another essential element that we need. And so Shani told Nancy, try and put them in your shakes, cut them up and put them in your fruit shakes. And Nancy said oh that the taste, <laughs> oh yeah, that's one. Wait, now you're going to like the second one better. So Nancy, so Nancy said the taste is a little tough and Nancy, we used to have Nancy food in the house and the taste was always a little tough. So if she says it's a little tough, but it is doable. The other thing is you can fry banana peels and Nancy says she makes now like a sub sandwich and it's almost as if it's like bacon, ki'ilu bacon on her little sandwich that she makes with banana peels. So I think what you can do is look online and maybe find a lot of good cooking um, tips of what to do with those things that, that you think. The, the banana peels and the, the shakes, I haven't dared tried on anybody yet, but it's out there. Um, I also very much think about carbon footprint and, and traveling and, and using cars and so on and so forth. So this, this again, like we talked to about last time is, you know, what, what are you gonna set as your priorities for how you're going to live? And what's going to make you feel good and feel like you're doing something singly, singly, rather than, you know, conquering the whole huge kind of industrial, which relates back to what Alexandra was talking about. Um, and I think Jason gave us a very, anyway, me a very good insight onto that. And I recommended it because I brought the things that my daughter-in-law bought for me in Holland, like these amazing vegetable brushes made out of all natural fiber and natural wood and so on and so forth that are recyclable and you just once you finish using them and I think that's for 
us as consumers, like you say, is a very, um, and Naomi also said it, you, you need to choose your battles and choose what makes you feel good and choose and share with your friend <laughs> Lorraine and I do that a lot. What are those things that are doable for you rather than coming from the kind of, excuse me, Alex, <laughs> the dark side of the industry <laughs> and so on and so forth, because because we need, we use those industries. So we need to look, I think the least of, of the evils. That's it. Yeah, Lorraine wanted no, to say something. I have, I two, uh, hello. I Hi. have two points. I, I have two points to come up with. First off, um, one in Jerusalem. Um, as far as composting, there is a comp composting garden uh, down the street from where I live here in Jerusalem. So I'm very, very blessed. So that's one thing. Another thing that my daughter, who's um, involved with waste management in California, Los Angeles, with the municipalities, um, was able to help pass a law in Los Angeles, which outlaws the um, throwing away of chicken bones and banana peels and other food um, things that could be recycled. So, um, she is working in the private sector in waste management uh, with a sustainability background, but somehow she got in cahoots with other people to work in the municipalities. And she does work with the municipalities um, to make sure that they are um, uh, working on their sustainability and recycling elements. So she got involved and my thinking is, is that she does not have any time, I know that, but she convinced her boss um, who somehow loves her because she's a hard worker and um, that this was important. She's also vegan. And so she personally makes mountains of food stuff that needs to be recycled. And somehow this is now a law along with not using, um, giving out plastic bags in grocery stores in Los Angeles. So my thinking is, is that somebody who has no time um, can get something done if they go in cahoots with other people who are in the industry of sustainability with other private corporations. And I only say this because I know that it has worked in my personal professional background, working with colleagues across the country. But it does take a while to build up a network. I truly encourage anybody who is wanting to be on the dark side because Alexandra, I know I worked with the dark side many, many times for many years, but also on the brighter side <laughs> that there is a way around and through and with people by actually finding out in your community who is in your community that you can have coffee with and find out what they're doing in their private sector corporations. And then one is better than nothing, two is much better than one. And it's really important to build up your network and build up your people and try and realize that there's a cookie jar that you want to get into and you may not have the answer of how to find the lid but by two people you might be able because the two of you um alex and maya there's a set there's a phrase in hebrew called biyacha together work together and use your brains and find out how, Maya, you can find people in Miami. I'm sure there's other like-minded people. It's a huge situation. How to recycle the food waste. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something that I've ran into, and this is something that I'll talk about in the next slide where I talk about development that's happening literally a mile from my backyard in, in right. the Everglades, is yeah. sometimes, unfortunately, a little bit of the difference between... So in Miami, there's there's an appetite, like quite literally, for for you know composting and for donating food scraps. And where I live, about 45 minutes into the suburbs, um, my city ended our recycling program last year. Um, and so the the thought of them implementing like a, a municipal composting um, 
program, I think is close to, to zero. So it really would come Lorraine, right as you said, from just like connecting with people to see how we can at least limit in some way our, our own food waste. Unfortunately, um, it's just the, the city itself is not entirely progressive when it comes to environmental causes. But you know, but, uh, okay, Maya, I can appreciate what you're saying. I come from an activist background and I'm a worldwide activist in a lot of different areas. And I, and I brought that to a board meeting early this morning with a lot of chuckles as received by you know people in the in the room. I can be a very negative person in the dark side, Alex, but I am also somewhat hopeful. And I know that some municipalities are more receptive and responsive than other municipalities, especially in this, especially in this political area. But the reality is, as I have found, that if people want to get reelected, especially at this period of time, they will be more responsive. And by going over and being sweet and just saying very carefully, you know, the newspaper would love to hear about this, what you're not doing. I, I'd like I'd like to make a point, Lorraine, because you I'm, I think your commitment here is so much appreciated and so important. I'm so glad you've joined the Jerusalem Green Fund. I must tell you, I'm very proud that you're, you've become one of us and a member. Uh, uh, I want to relate to something that Alexandra put on the chat two chats ago. She mentioned that I can't remember where in Holland they're no longer separating. Garbage. Precisely, it's just a general waste bin, and then there's a can bin. And uh, so to I be just honest, want to point out. I just want to point out because I have recently, uh, most of my life, I'm I'm volunteering, running the Jerusalem Green Fund and the Israel Urban Forum. But I also have a consultancy job with a, with an international dark side firm, you could say, um, which is trying to sell solutions for garbage to Israel. And they're called WTP, you can look them up. Their record, I think, is quite good. But they have, they have solved, they are dealing with the garbage in Atlanta Airport, Lax Airport. They're now going to, working with the Bahamas. They've got some, some things going in Holland. The world generally is departing from recycling. This is something that is actually happening. And going to total solutions through which 95% of total garbage can be turned into what you put at the end here, compost, animal feed, biofuel, or a few other products. So it's a kind of um, uh, sorting at the end and not at source, uh, and taking that, supposedly taking that burden off us humans who are facing like what Maya is with her banana peel uh, and various other issues. And the question is, um, I'm, 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 I'm working with them because I am aware that Israel is, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem is dumping 1,500 tons of garbage a day over and above what Lorraine is taking to the compost bin in her community garden, over and above what's in my com compost bin, over and above all kinds of good things that are going on. And I don't think that one rule precludes the other. We may need these total garbage solutions in addition to good education and community activism. And one can live alongside the other, especially in the big cities. In the big cities, we're, we're still going to go to the supermarket and buy food, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be growing some parsley on our balcony or have a lemon tree in the garden. So it's 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 all. It's all very tricky and all very complex, but my main feeling today, looking at the tremendous complexities around me, is that one route does not preclude the other. Looking cynically at the dark side is something we need to do. Uh, looking hopefully at the bright side is something we must do. We must do it because otherwise we'll all go mad. Uh, and, and I think that for, for, for Jewish people, we have our concept of tikkun olam, which is repairing the world, whereby each individual has to try and do something in the belief that if all the individuals do something, 
then, then a lot of good can happen. So we need to be aware of all that's going wrong, but also be happy about the things that we as individuals and communities can put right and not lose hope. That's the main thing. Hope yeah. should definitely be the main driver. And to just add a last point, the dark side should trigger you, but it should not trigger a hopelessness or a demise or diminish what individuals are doing. The main point is be critical and be observant about the status quo because that's the only way that the quotas, the performance and the greenification can grow. Otherwise, we are stuck in what we are getting portrayed from the dark side. And that is not the best they can do because it's profitable, okay, to a certain degree, but currently not so much to be at the highest level of performance. And that's precisely why I took those three examples. You're doing good with less pollutant cars, for sure, but keep a tabs on what's happening in the whole supply chain. How does the electricity reach your car? And to add to that, uh, carpe diem, and Maya, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Alex and Naomi, Lorraine, Eileen, for, um, for that feedback. Something that Alex and I were talking about, I didn't end up including it in this um, brief presentation because it's just like so complex, but I was reading a different article um, about a city in Sweden that essentially um, incinerates all of the trash and is able to supply close to almost 100% of their heating and different electricity with this trash. Now, there's certainly some pushback there. I mean, Sweden is, if, is, if not the most environmentally conscious country, one of them, Lauren, I see you're shaking your head. This could be a whole other topic that we talk about. Um, I, I, I tell you what I'd like it to lead into, Maya. Because we in Jerusalem here, in the Jerusalem Green Fund, it's something I've been looking at for the last five years. I want for the Jerusalem region to establish a Jerusalem Green Business Forum. I've been thinking about this all through this talk. And one of the main questions that comes up, how do we know that a green business is really green? Who's going to, who's going to be keeping tabs on them? I've got several people in our staff looking into this now and thinking about how to do it. If some of you would like to be involved in this process and give some advice and consultation on it, it could be extremely useful. And please, count like, me in. please count me in. Please count me in. One of our meetings, I can, get, I can get the people who are starting to look at it to present our initial ideas of how to approach Jerusalem businesses. Uh, and we're thinking of small businesses, not big businesses. And that may be the big difference that the, 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 the large businesses are perhaps the real dark side but for the small businesses there's hope yeah, and I think also from the from the technological side as well, from this article that I was reading in Sweden, essentially the, the municipality itself could not operate this, this production of being able to incinerate so much of their trash and of course divert it from landfills. Now, of course, there's some pollutants involved in here, so not everything is, is perfect, um, but really I think that this is a really important moment for the tech sector to really step up to the plate because in order to have these really innovative solutions we will need really innovative technologies so that's again uh that could be a whole other conversation i know that we want to leave some time for a general discussion at the end so i'm just going to quickly go into um a second topic about development so this is a picture from uh, a news report of my quite frankly, like my backyard, like I said, about um, a mile away from where I live. So I live in South Florida, very close to the Everglades. And we have a pretty, I would say respectful relationship, some more than others, but the area where I live in was only developed around 30 years ago. So it's a really new area. And so I live right off of the Everglades and there's this beautiful park that I bike past almost daily that currently is being cleared by the private owner. As you see, we see the bulldozers. I hear it every morning. Um, there's a lot of action being taken in my own neighborhood and in the surrounding neighborhoods, people who do not want to lose this, who know that the Everglades is just an amazing um, ecological, magical place. Now, the question here, though, is that um, our city is trying to buy back this land from a private owner. So bringing it back to the private sector, we have this weird system where just 
people can just own all the lands that they want. And so essentially what's happened here is that one of the owners of this land um, confirmed in writing that it's being prepared for future for future um, sale. And he's essentially saying that unless our city who has proposed to buy back this land can give him this amount or more, it's being cleared. Um, so the reason why I, I brought this up is I feel like the notion of sustainable urban development is like amazing, but we so often, at least in my perspective, the, the development world is just like, they really don't care. They really don't care, um, especially these individual um, CEOs who like the Everglades means nothing to them. They don't live close to here. Um, so the reason why I brought this up is really because I know that in the Jerusalem Green Fund, when I was interning there now about a year and a half ago, Rehez Levan was a really big point of action. And so I really just wanted to bring this here because development is a place where I feel like the private sector is like the, one of the worst. Um, and this could be, again, me just being cynical. Um, like I said, this is, again, the intersection of the public sector and the private sector. Our public sector is trying to, you know, hold on to this land. The people power is behind it. But this, at the end of the day, it comes down to this private owner who, for whatever zoning purposes, can do whatever ever he wants with it. So this is the last thing that um, I wanted to bring up just to hear about some best practices, um, because this is actively happening right now. We know that the land is going to get cleared regardless. Um, and the best that we can do is have the city buy it back and make it into some sort of public park. Um, but unfortunately, we're already we're already kind of losing, right? Because this area is being cleared. So I wanted to to bring it up to to the group just to again get any ideas or or best practices from maybe your um, your own your own lives and in, in your own countries. Can I make a comment here, Maya? Because yeah. um, there are there are three different issues with land. There is um, zoning is one thing. That's decided by the local authorities or the national authorities. There is ownership and there is sovereignty, which in, in our part of the world always becomes very relevant, possibly less relevant in the middle of Miami. In Miami, you're dealing with who owns the land and what's it zoned for mm -hmm. and who has the right to change that zoning. Right. And the people who have the right to change the zoning are your local authorities, who you, the good people of Miami, voted in. And one of the things that I learned many, many years ago from a, a city engineer in Jerusalem, who was a lady, gave a lecture once to community centers, and I was one of the leaders there. And she said the following sentence. She said, citizens get the urban planning that they deserve. <laughs> it, was a, it was a terrible sentence to say, but it set me to thinking, because she said, if when you go to vote for your local government, what you have on your agenda is what's going to be done with natural resources in the city? How's the garbage going to be dealt with? If that's your agenda, then you may just, and you can persuade your potentially electable officials that this agenda is important to hundreds of thousands of people in the city, then they will want to do it because they want to be reelected after that. And by the way, that's what the Jerusalem Green Fund is about now in establishing a lobby, in having 80 organizations working together in the city we are now preparing a platform for the next municipal elections that are going to be next November, which is why we're trying to build up a, 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 a sense of presence in the city. We're having this wonderful festival towards the end of the week, green inside and out with about 50 different events of different lobby groups going on all around the city. This is to create, first of all, a sense that we're doing things together. And secondly, to impress the powers that be that we are a presence that needs to be uh, related to and treated very, very seriously. And that anyone who's competing for power, who will then make those decisions and run those planning committees, uh, will, will have to consider our needs, which is your needs in this case. But there is a very big difference between Miami and Jerusalem. And I don't know what the status is in different parts, because in Israel, the land is owned by the state. There is a land reserve authority that is in effect the government. So the government is actually, in the case of Rehes Levan, which you remember so well, it's actually trying to make money out of its own property and turning its own natural resources into real estate. 
which you could say is wicked. And some people will say, well, it's going to provide the housing for future generations of Jerusalemites. But in the case of Rechus Levan, our lobby proved its worth and got the mayor to change his mind and to plan differently from what he had intended to plan. And, and, and to reach a compromise and save most of the land that was going to be sacrificed in Rechus Levan. What you have to do in this case is a different thing altogether. Getting a lot of people involved could have an effect on the city being prepared to buy up the land and, and turn it into that very park that you want um, to happen. And maybe that's the way to go, because I see Lorraine is nodding. It's something that's being done in the United States that's not being done in Israel, buying up land to protect it. It can be done privately and it can be done publicly. Yeah, I have to just grab my charger for a second, um, but I didn't want to leave in the middle of that sentence. It's very interesting because the, the property itself is zoned as farming, but we learned that farming can be extremely liberally interpreted. And so farming in some weird iteration can actually mean a nursery, like um, a both a, like a, a nursing home and a nursery itself. <laughs> and so this probably has to do with just like a little bit of wickedness, probably. Um, so that is just a little bit more context around that piece of land. Um, for the the software company that I, I work with, we work with a lot of different um, family foundations and a lot of them are rooted in environmental sustainability. And one of the, the family foundations that we're working with is actually thinking about um, getting into land trusts. So that could be oh. a whole other conversation where like, this is a family with like generational wealth who really just like wants to buy land to preserve it, right? Um, so it's just, there's a lot to be said of like, what is the role of like your dollar as well? Um, need to go get my um my charger but would love to just hear from like the whole group um before we um you know get into the logistics of planning out next session like yimmy jason noga lauren sammy for the, the whole group everyone just um yeah your overall thoughts i know it can be a little depressing sometimes like but the reality check is also needed so yeah just love to hear everyone going off camera for a quick second yeah something that someone close to me once told me is like this world requires that you hold beauty and like what's the opposite of beauty and like uh like the dark the dark stuff at the same time so i know my presentation last meeting was kind of covered the a lot of, it was very optimistic and alex's was more pessimistic but I, I really appreciate that I think you need you need to hold both and even with the pessimism you have to you just you have to find a way to want to hold that beauty and Alex on um, I really appreciate your demeanor by the I, I I think it's funny and there's actually a couple climate scientists that think one of the keys to addressing like climate change is to use like humor and comedy and they and they really think that's like going to be a crucial piece of like um dealing with like the challenges mm. coming our way and they, they think humor is like essential i can send you their names and there's like some like i i think i think i know whom you're talking about because i actually got two forbes 500 companies to sign climate action deals within their countries of operation just by being a bit of my well cynical humor self in my meetings <laughs> so so now we have two large pollutants promising to cut down their performances by 50 percent in the next 20 years and they've already cut 10 percent after the consultation with my company so the dark side is doing good it's not going at the pace it should be just a friendly reminder but we're doing our best even with a darth Vader hat on you know <laughs> yeah we, we 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 gotta work with the dark side we got to <laughs> We some people it. haven't said anything, and I'm not going to say any more until some other people say some things. Like Lauren? Um, well, I also think it's important to address the dark side because, I mean, my grandpa, I was just telling him about our meeting, and he was like, well, what about, like, the other countries that are producing a lot? He specifically said, like, China and how they're, like, mass producing um, in their like we've got Yimmy onto that don't worry 
Yeah, but um, I was just saying, like, I don't know. It's hard because he's saying, like, no matter how much, like, one country does, we all need to get on it. And, I mean, I just think, like, it's hard when you're, like, obviously, like, we're all trying to be positive here. But, like, it is true that, like, it needs to be, like, a mass effort. And, like, how you're saying that, like, over 50% of pollutants are from the large companies. Like, I just, like, I don't know how to approach that, you know? It's kind of, like, outside of something that your brain can comprehend so I think you're doing like a great job and like how you've been doing it so far but yeah <laughs> so thank you <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> so we Noga, Lauren, Yimi say something important okay <laughs> have you ever heard about how to make ends uh, ends of me how to make what uh, I said enzyme. it. Enzyme. 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 Yeah. How to say it? Enzyme. Enzyme. Yeah, enzyme. Yeah, we Which? use the the fruit because you know uh, my family is we uh, uh sixty percent of our diet are fruits, so we we use it to you make enzyme, and you can use it to wash your hair. And uh, you can use it for everything nearly. So, uh, yeah, just for for you to use if you don't want to do compost. Another thing I want to share is the best thing that can digest, you know, everything is soil. So maybe connect a, a native uh, organic farm to to do the thing and the. Just like Lauren said, just, um, you know, build your own network. Maybe you can just, uh, you know, get all people there to support a, a farm. So the farm can come up to pick up your, your waste every, you know, every two or three days. And you, you and the, he can at the same time to, to just to give you your fruits, uh, vegetables, whatever you need. And the last thing I want to share is our, you know, about the land policy in China because we don't own any land. But but the the a better thing, you know, the best side side of it is you can change the the the, you know, if the land is for for agriculture is for agriculture forever. If it is for you know, you can chop down the. The, any rules unless you have you know uh, even though you rent this land you have to you have no right to chop off any any tree you know this is in That's China yeah so because, you have permanent zoning yeah mm -hmm. we so, don't have that no. yeah <laughs> we do mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you know this is uh, you know um, Three dimension world, so we have both sides. Uh, how to play it? I think it's a game, you know, depends on how you play it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Yimmy. And I feel like something that I've learned from our conversations here is just each city has its own culture and will find, hopefully, the people will find what works best for that specific city. So, what works in Jerusalem probably won't work in, you know, Pembroke Pines, won't work in New York, in China, etc. Um, something that I didn't mention before is like I had posted on on Facebook saying like, please, are there any, because uh, Whole Foods Market, if, if people know Whole Foods, they used to accept compost or they used to accept food scraps and then turn it into compost. And this was amazing. There's a Whole Foods like, you know, if you live I don't know, there was like a Whole Foods a few blocks away from me. And so I thought that was perfect. Well, they stopped their program. And so there's there's a lot to be said about that. Um, but I had posted on Facebook, just asking like, are there any restaurants that accepted or any farms? And I actually for like a few months was able to connect with um, just a local family farm. And I was able to give my food scraps to like their pigs and all of the different um, livestock that they had. And eventually, um, I guess like, they came back and said like this is great but i guess they were a little nervous right because i'm just like a person who's just giving their um animals food i mean i'm a 
good person, but I could, you know, if I was evil, I could easily be, you know, like putting toxins in there. So I guess like they had come back and thought about it more. They're like, oh, sorry, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, but there are a ton of nurseries in South Florida because we love our exotic um, flowers and trees. And so maybe this is a, an idea of just connecting with one of those nurseries and seeing if they'll accept it. So I'll keep you all posted about um, my journey. I'm, I'm definitely committed to it and and hate just throwing food into into the trash can. But again, what works in my city might be different from from somewhere else. So I'll let you know how this journey continues. Wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on that, Maya, because we receive from a company um, organic farm every week organic uh, vegetables. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna call and see if they would accept the food waste for their compost and for doing that because I now know that at my son-in-law's that they weren't composting for a long time and in Pardescana which is a very very liberated kind of um, um, <laughs> now and future community that's a lot of barter and not money exchange and so on and so forth that they weren't doing compost when I asked my daughter she said mom it's like ludicrous to ask about compost in Pardescana I'm like Sarai no one's hardly exchanging money here and um, now they're doing compost and with the farmers of uh, their organic um, from, and it's a really nice kind of circular idea to get the food and, and give them um, the compost from our food. And, and certainly there's definitely, because there's definitely rules and regulations you need to follow as far as compost, but it's one, once again, for me, one of those feel goods. You know, when I'm sitting and cutting the banana peels instead of throwing the whole one in, I'm like, I know why I'm doing this for the earth and to make it, you know, better and more easily and quickly compostable. So, um, and the nursery idea is also a very good one. I don't know where we're going to interject that, Naomi, and, and the Green Fund, but nurseries might be a whole part of our uh, green business forum, Naomi. Uh, nurseries should be, depends what they're growing, how they're growing it why they're growing it and who they're selling it to for what. Right. Excuse my all of those. I, Eileen, I have, a, I have a question about the banana. You, you were talking about frying banana peels like, right. and turning them into a snack? Yeah, or putting it in a, in a sandwich. Yeah, look it up online. Or That's shampoo. Yimmy right, said yeah. shampoo. Yeah, Yimmy said like all And I think it. we should ask Yimmy to give us a lesson in how to make shampoo and all kinds of useful products. And I'm going to ask about the enzymes, all the enzymes. Yeah. Yeah. Could you uh, do that, some, uh, Yeah, fruit peels can make enzyme, and you know, all different kinds of enzyme. Could you yeah. demonstrate it to us and show us how you do it? Now? No, not now, at another meeting. Yeah, sure, sure. It's not that, that hard. It's very that's, easy, that's great. actually. That's great. Uh -huh. But it sounds wonderful. And Yemi, you, really? you put a link to a video in the chat, yeah, right? Just yeah. check oh, the video. Oh, you have to make your enzymes. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and there is a lot of things that you can find on because it's it's a, it's a Filipino who invented this, and it's also used all across the China, and they can you know help to for your skin for your hair. I use enzyme to wash my clothes as well, and uh, the 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 water won't pollute the, the underwater what underwater system. You know, you can just. Uh, Water it, whatever you want. As far as I can see, Yibi is the real thing, the genuine article. <laughs> in spite of all that is going wrong in China, we have hope with Yibi. <laughs> Next time I have a meeting, you know, as a fruitarian, and we eat all of our fruit and then cut it down to, to you, you, can, you only use a big can and the fruit peel and the um, black sugar and the water. That's it not that hard something that makes me think about yimmy talk turning food waste into some sort of products is like i know humans like 300 years ago we used to be like super resourceful and if something broke we'd find a way to turn it into something else and now we're just so used to just like just a consumer society we buy everything we need and so That's i, I just, yeah i it's it, interesting like how could we yeah, my I, my sister is someone who's like very like resourceful, and it's um I I wonder if like that resourcefulness if that like kind of can 
if that can like be manifested in, in a consumer society because we've kind of lost that ability to like be so resourceful. Like most of us don't know how to be resourceful. Now. Like resourceful. Well, what you're saying, Jason, is that we need. We used to have a completely circular economy and we did it without thinking. It was necessary, it was needed, it was done. Now we're saying we need to achieve a circular economy. You're saying we need really to go back to a circular economy. Yeah. Right. Jason, I think right. you do a lovely lesson for your students on uh, like enzymes and, and waste and things like that. You could teach the younger generation. I love it for your science students. It's great. Yeah, I'll I'll talk more about that another. I have to be careful and not like do things that are way. I believe in them, but I don't want to like confuse them. So I don't know if enzymes would be a little too much. But I, yeah. Lauren, would you like to enlarge upon what you wrote in the chat? What is a make take waste economy? Uh, I'm just kind of agreeing with what Jason is saying, but um, it's you know it's basically that that we're not in a resourceful mindset at all anymore. And we um, think of everything as kind of single use in a lot of ways. And we produce a ton of single use things. We make them, we use them once and then they go straight to you know, a waste place. And a lot of what we've been talking about here, I think is really interesting about all of the different potential approaches we can take. And one thing that's really resonating with me is how how everyone kind of treats this issue from a different mindset and it, it's very personal as well and I think it's also kind of like a journey so I'm thinking about how when I first got into this movement probably around like 15-ish years ago um, my focus was mainly on my personal stuff like how can I compost and how can I use less plastic and how can I ride my bike and how can I you know how can I make my personal life because I can control my sphere how can I make that as sustainable as possible. And it's great and it has some feel good aspects to it, um, but it's also exhausting <laughs> as well. And it takes a lot of your um, thought process, you know, it's like, okay, how, like when Maya was talking about all of that work that she's doing to try to get composting, you know, like that is a lot of organizing that goes into, and that's just one person taking initiative for themselves, you know? And so that is like a really rough, like hard angle on this whole thing and then we so then we can also look at like putting pressure on um private sectors which we've talked about as well as additional the public sector and those kind of go hand in hand um but it's kind of like without different approaches we get stuck in a certain place you know we can put pressure on the corporations but if they're not being regulated then what incentive do they have to listen to us uh alex way to go and convincing them with your humor to get them to make uh you know some actual um and i'm sure it was way more than just your humor but you know well, it just... was also like a tax saving <laughs> aspect to it there you go if yeah. the regulation isn't there then i can be as charming as i want but they will say no <laughs> right, because it doesn't add up, you know, the numbers are there. And, you know, it's really easy to be like, oh, they're the dark side and they're evil. Um, but also, I think a lot of it is like, why, why would they do this when profit, basically, I would say profit and capitalism has a lot to do with this. So all of their incentives are saying, do the other thing. And then we show up and we're like, yeah, but it's hurting the planet. And they're like, yeah, but in, you know, my situation, this is what I, this is what I need to do. So, so I think, I don't know. Everything is the key, right? So we need to put pressure on the um, the public sector to regulate these things harder so that we don't fall into a situation where they're clearing out the Everglades and they can just kind of point the fingers all around. And when you were saying that, like, what can we do? I was like, the only thing that came to mind to me was like direct action. It's like we can go chain ourselves on the property and, you know, make a fuss and get in the you know news. <laughs> and that sort of thing is like what can kind of like make the shift because all this stuff is kind of happening in some ways kind of behind closed doors or no one really knows who's responsible or who to hold accountable or how we can do that. But I think that's why a group like this is super awesome because we are sharing ideas, sharing successes, you know, sharing tactics from around the planet. That is one of the benefits of our globalized society is we also have global communication and we can, as grassroots organizers, we can find out what's going on and hopefully copy it in places where, you know, where it's relevant. Um, so yeah, Lauren, these are my thoughts. <laughs> Lauren, they're wonderful thoughts, but I was just just see what Jason wrote in the in the chat, and I think we can all agree as a group that if we manage to put the shampoo industry out of business, this group will have proved successful. 
<laughs> that would be one of the ways to measure our success. <laughs> By the way, I go to the pharmacy and I see shampoo made from avocado, shampoo made from this. Are they using enzymes, Yimmy? I don't know. What are they doing? Are they fooling us? Never mind. No one needs to answer that question. But what we do I think it's just like do... synthetic fragrances half of the time. <laughs> what we do need to do is decide when we're going to meet again, right. not where, because it's going to be on Zoom, how we can expand our group a little bit, gently, gradually. I think we've had a lovely attendance today and it's nice. Who would like to present next time and what? Would you like other presentations? Uh, Sammy wants to present. Do you know what uh, you want to present, Sammy? Um, so I was thinking because um, we were hearing about Maya like struggling with the compost and stuff. And I moved into a new apartment um, and I told them that I want to compost and start a garden, but I honestly don't even know where to start with that. So I was thinking that maybe I could like do a little presentation of like how to start your own composting bin. Like I live in an apartment, so very accessible for people. Um, and then I was thinking like, I also, I'll look into it more for like the group presentation, but I was like how I could plant different things that I could be eating in Los Angeles for every month, because I know like each month you can have a different like seasonal crop. First of all, it's healthier. Second of all, it's like organic if you're like using your own compost. So like just basically a way to like easily and accessibly have your own food and compost because I need to learn it myself. So I was just thinking if I made a presentation for everyone, we could just like kill two birds one stone. And, and, Not and Sammy, you might want to be in touch with Yimmy, who is really a global expert on this. She's, okay. She, and and she can give you some. She can give you some hints. Maybe 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 do it together even. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll talk to Yimmy about it if you're down. <laughs> I have to figure out the the time um, difference because you're. East oh my gosh! Yes, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. you're in Los you're in Los Angeles and she's in Beijing. Right. Yeah. What's the difference Lost between you? I don't okay. know. <laughs> well, no, just thinking well, about time doesn't exist. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're just that I've I've uh, I've I've tried to implement like composting where I've been and I've done it like not successfully. So I'm you know I'd be happy to like talk with you a little bit about what, like what I did. And yeah, they're, I know they're they're experts. They're people that like for a living they like roll out like composting systems for like buildings, and so I like I have some of these names that I could send to you, and you can like look them up. Or... And then looking oh. ahead, another time, you know, Noga, who interned with us in the Jerusalem Green Fund, is now working in the Jerusalem Green Fund, a small part of a job, and she's also working with the community center Kiryat Menachem, where we have projects. And I'd like the time after that, Noga, for you to start thinking about presenting the work that you have done with trees and what you're doing with nature in the neighborhood where you're working. That could be very interesting and illuminating. But next time we're going to go for Sammy growing her own food, which sounds very, very good. She's going to do it with Yimmy's help. But when will that be, friends? Should we look at the calendar? Oh, you know what? I can't send this chat out. Huh. What do you mean you can't send the chat? I don't know. I just uh, responded to Lauren's um, question about um, the session, and Lauren, I wrote, I'm recording it, and now that Sammy is gone, <laughs> I oh no, I'm my... here. No, no, but you're not here. Here with me. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> now that Sammy, I need to find another intern to download it. No, send... one of the one of the staff will help you. Even Noga will help you. Someone will help you. Don't okay. worry. Okay, so okay. We'll, and I'll send it out. Yeah, great. She's okay. going to email me the PowerPoint, which is mainly what I'm looking for. But yeah, whatever you send out is great too. Okay. The PowerPoint should go to all of us. It was fascinating, full yeah, of humor, um, full of dark things, light things, medium things. And the question is the next date. Yeah. Let's have a look. September. October. Mm. um it's clearly to, going to, when is it going to be eileen i don't know we come up to a slew of holidays through october and then um so it would be 
probably six weeks is today is the nine the eleven. So it'd be like kind of the middle of November, but I'm on my birthday month <laughs> and I plan all kinds of events. So if anything, it would be towards the, I'm taking my daughters to Petra, to Jordan, and I've got all kinds of things that if anybody's around in Jerusalem, you should, you're all invited to all these extraordinary places that people don't know in and around Israel and Jerusalem. How about the 13th of November? No, that's flat. They're, they're, no, it's got to be the end of November, Naomi, when I'm going to be after the event, the birthday event season. Okay, the end of November. Let's look towards the end of November. Please. I'm supposed to be going to a conference in Germany at the end of November, but I don't know the dates yet. Uh -huh. um, but we'll see. Okay, so maybe we should go, I would even say about the 27th, because Daron and I are going to be in Tiberias um, from the 13th to the 20th. Okay, how's the 27th of November? It's quite a long way off. Yeah, oh, that's too September, bad. October, November, it's, 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 two and a half months ah i don't like it i get i get worried that it's so far apart well, but, 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 but you just did that i know, <laughs> <laughs> I know. um so, so how about during the cookie? or maybe like towards the end of october then okay let's have a look at the end of october i like the sound of that a little bit better sammy is that I'm okay? with you in your city? yeah what well, is that 30th right? of October? Sunday, the 30th of October. Okay, that's right before Halloween. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> so is, that, is that bad? Do you all do Halloween? No, 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 no. It's totally fine. <laughs> You're not going out with trick or treat and things like that? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> no me <meat>, trick or treats. <laughs> <laughs> So okay. this is our global um and if coalition. anybody has any suggestions while Naomi's typing it of other other folks that might be interested, because I do, but I feel kind of Naomi and I speak of this of expanding it a bit, um, but not too fast because we really wanted to have a at least a, a track record of us together and see the kind of the synergy and, and what what goes on and comes out. So um, I would certainly, we would, I think Naomi Nahon, we could, we could expand a bit to other. Another one or two, we can cope with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Lorraine, you're certainly, um, and, and Lorraine's daughter is the one in LA is, is under a lot of um, pressure also, pregnant pressure and so on and so forth, but we'll look forward to her. And I also have some outside people that I think of during our discussions, but we really wanted to, <laughs> Stay internal for the first first rounds of it, and then and then maybe okay. Start and and I'm it. I'm going to, I'm going to be on vacation in the Turks and Caicos on in that week in October. Where are you going? Uh, Turks and Caicos, a beach. Okay. A beach and a, and a, <laughs> a small <laughs> island. Small island. Sounds lovely. I Sounds know. Good. I'm looking forward to it. Not with the friend hey. behind you. No, no, no. This is with the friend who's going to be landing uh, tomorrow who just called me from America. My husband. Okay. okay. Do you think I got your daughter's information? Because she lives in LA as well. I'm sorry, what? Do you think that I could get your daughter's information since she lives in LA and is doing environmental stuff? Um, I'll ask her, Sammy. Why don't you... Um, uh, send me your email and then you and I can talk. Okay, awesome. Thank that you. Sounds great. I would love it. I, I okay, gotta so, head up though and talk to my husband though. He just called me a little bit and he said we need to talk. So I don't know what that means. So uh, I said uh, I'm coming up here. <laughs> so you'll be on a beach on the 30th, but we may meet on the 30th and uh and it will be recorded and then you'll see okay. all the wonderful dark sides and light sides. Absolutely. And how to compost and how to grow food. 